Sounds a call to come together and united we shall stand. Let us live and act for freedom in South Africa. Thank you very much. Uh, I can hear that you're saying you, you, you could have joined. Let me acknowledge uh, the following people, the trustees of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Professor Hamilton, Maya Makanji, Mrs. Irene Menel, Dr. Mampela Rampele, Ntate Tokyo Sekhwale, Ntate Selomoloko, Ntate Khalema Matlante in his absence, Nigo Bikicha in her absence, and Futim Toba in her absence. I'd also like to acknowledge in the audience the Herville family, uh, Sean Johnson, the CEO of the Mandela, Mandela Roads Foundation, who's here. Uh, I saw Ter Terry Bell and uh, Barbara Bell. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, ambassadors here present, the, the, the resident uh, at the rep. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, but as you did go with ambassadors, you, you taught us well that uh, in the past we, sh we could say all protocol observed, uh, but I'm told that in the 2000s we then say, consider yourselves protocoled while I observe you. <laughs> it is at this point that I then call on uh, our host for the day, Kathy Motlatlala. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And let me reiterate, Dati Hatta, not even water was going to keep us away from Cape Town this afternoon. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to be with you all. And I believe that in this room, you're feeling a little bit of the magic, the Madiba magic, that is. This morning, I was fortunate to be part of a group that went to Robben Island. And while we were on this tour and we were walking the corridors of Robben Island, our tour guide, uh, Mr. Sekhwale and others, when we got to the cell said, if you touch the prison bars, you're touching Madiba's DNA. A little bit of him is still left there. And I believe that by making your presence here today, he's not just at that cell, but in fact, he's carried in each and every one of our hearts. So thank you for coming out this afternoon to celebrate the legacy and the memory of Tata Madiva. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Today's conversation comes at an opportune moment, especially in South Africa. Over 50%, as you may know, of South Africa's population is living in poverty. It's a revelation that was made this year by the Statistician General. When we look at closely at those numbers, it's women and children who make up the majority of the poor. But to be specific, it is black women in rural areas and children who are living on less than 441 rand a month. I want you to think about that. As we honor the legacy of Nelson Mandela, we also remember that he was a champion for women's empowerment and gender equality. He understood that we cannot talk about freedom when half the population is living under the yoke of patriarchy and through structural and institutionalized form of race, of discrimination rather, are denied equal opportunity in our democratic order. So our duty today in having this conversation is that we find practical ways in which we can build a truly inclusive society. It's therefore fitting that the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Ms. Amina J. Mohammed, will help us understand 
the centrality of gender and why it's crucial for reducing poverty, inequality, and inclusivity. If you're still feeling a little bit uneasy about being welcome in the room, let me call up on stage somebody who's been with this journey since the very first day. May I am told that you were there at the very first Nelson Mandela lecture. So in order to give us the keys to the city, please come to the front. Good afternoon. Goeiemiddag, Mulweni. It's a great honor and a pleasure for me to welcome you to Cape Town. But let me welcome our sister, UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed. Of course, our own mama, Grasha Michelle, uh, the CEO of Nelson Mandela uh, Foundation, Salo Hafton, and the chairman of the foundation, Prof. Of course, all the trustees of the Nelson Mandela Foundation and Children's Fund, all our public representatives that are here, it's truly an honor to welcome you to Cape Town, but to also welcome such great South African and international leaders to reflect on some of the most pressing issues facing our society. It is really unbelievable that we are approaching four years since the passing of our great leader and unifier, Tata Madiba. It's occasions such as these where we can deeply reflect on the legacy that he has left behind for us. And we have to constantly ask ourselves whether we have lived up to that legacy. Tata Madiba's name is associated with love, peace, compassion, justice, reconciliation, and many others. He led the way and brought us together in our pain and anger to draft our beautiful constitution. This is a great man who had a deep, deep love for his people and for his country. Although Tata Madiba gave his freedom so that his people could be liberated, he never wanted to be acknowledged on his own as if he did it alone. He always spoke of the sacrifices made by the people and other leaders such as Owal Tambu, Walter Sisulu, Steve Bantubiko, Helen Sussman, Robert Sabukwe, and many others. It is that kind of selfless leadership that we should look up to and inspire to replicate. When we wrote the Constitution and assigned powers to the president, we had leaders like Tata Madiba in mind. And unfortunately, we have to reconsider those constitutional provisions based on our past experiences after President Tata Madiba. Today, we have to do deep introspection as a nation to review whether we are realizing the objectives and values of Tata Madiba that he lived by. He loved all the people of this country, but he had a special place in his heart for children and women. And in this regard, I would like to congratulate the Nelson Mandela Foundation, the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, of which I am a trustee, for the work that they are doing for keeping Tata Madiba's legacy alive. We have to ask ourselves as a country, are we protecting the most vulnerable in our society? Are we doing enough to put an end to the scourge of abuse of women and children? South Africa is still experiencing high levels of abuse and killing of women and children. And this is an indictment on us as a society. This calls for greater action from all sectors to stand together and put an end to this scourge. 
We cannot sit by idly in a world where people don't respect women and children. And we need to continue this fight to rid our nation of this despicable occurrence. Our dear Tata Madiba said, and I quote, freedom cannot be achieved unless the women have been emancipated from all forms of oppression. We must all work harder to ensure that all women are emancipated, emancipated from all forms of oppression, oppression, be it at home or be it at work. In conclusion, in 2018, next year, the city will be celebrating together with many other South Africans and organizations um, and honor this great man's legacy in the year that would have been his 100th birthday. On that note, it is a great pleasure once again to welcome all of you to the city of Cape Town. And I would love to implore on all of you that while you are in Cape Town, please save water like a local. <laughs> so thank you very much and God bless all of you. Mayor, I, I, I missed the part where you said lunch after this is on the city. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure, it's okay. <laughs> All right, our next speaker is really somebody who, le who needs a little introduction. He is an academic, an author, and today I've discovered he's also a good photographer. So please help me welcome on stage Professor Njabul Ndebele. <laughs> She remembers the photography bit because I took a photograph of her. <laughs> uh, distinguished guests and ladies and, and gentlemen, all respect has been accorded according to protocol uh, to all those that are here um, among us. On behalf of the Nelson Mandela Foundation's Board of Trustees, I thank you for attending the 15th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. Many individual expressions of thanks for making this day possible are due, and they will be conveyed by our chief executive in his closing remarks. But just two from me at the outset. The United Nations has been a pleasure to work with in bringing its Deputy Secretary General to deliver this lecture. And we are grateful to the city of Cape Town for hosting this lecture for the third time. I thank you, Mayor Delia, for that. <laughs> this year's lecture takes place as the foundation is deep in preparation both for the fourth anniversary of Nelson Mandela's passing and the centenary of his birth, remembering, commemorating, and reflecting, of course. What an extraordinary life he lived. What a rich and inspiring legacy he vouchsafed for us. What a dream for South Africa and the world he gave us. The lecture also takes place just days away from the fifth anniversary of the passing of the foundation's first chairman, Professor Jakes Herwell. We miss him intensely. When Nelson Mandela was drafting a memoir of his presidency, he reflected on the important role Jakes had played in support of him in those years and beyond. This reflection can be found in the just published book, Dare Not Linger, The Presidential Years. I want to read just a few sentences from almost a full page of text. 
He is an impressive and fearlessly independent thinker. In the field of human relations, he clearly emerges as a true leader who is devoid of paranoid tendencies and who encourages principled discussions. He constantly draws attention to those aspects of comrades which are designed to strengthen rather than weaken human relations. As chairperson of our foundation, he is a linchpin in keeping all of us working together harmoniously. And he nips in the bud any incipient developments towards any form of infighting among comrades. Few people are aware that he is also a polished negotiator on the international level. As long as there are men and women of this caliber and vision, world peace and the stability will continue to be the cornerstone of national and international relations. So said Mr. Nelson Mandela about Professor Jake Scherwell. We are delighted that members of his family can be with us today, and Phoebe, his widow, and children. Thank you for coming. We trust that today's event would have made Jake's proud. Our primary focus in these multiple moments of remembering will be on the work of Madiba mandated us to do. For in truth, his dream is far from being realized. In fact, if we were as blunt as he was wont to be, we would have to say that his dream has been recklessly and cynically trampled upon in many instances. Madiba played a towering role in bringing South African liberation from the yoke of apartheid. But as I have argued elsewhere, what our country now needs is a new covenant with its future in which South Africans passionately work to achieve their future on premises radically different from those that shaped their past against which a just struggle for liberation was successfully waged. The resilience of that past should never ever fool us into making it, that past itself, the primary purpose of our future. How we do create or recreate a purposeful sense of national community that takes its definition of itself from a constitutional order created by all South Africans at the very best of their visionary moment. How to work towards that future is the question all of us must tackle assiduously. It is clear that the work of liberation is not quite over. The Nelson Mandela Foundation is committed to contributing to this work. More specifically, we pursue a mandate to support and protect South Africa's institutions of democracy and to combat the terrible legacies of racism, poverty, inequality, and sexism. These are the values on which the future will be solidly built. It is no accident then that this year's annual lecture takes place on the UN International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Last year, the Board of Trustees took a decision to position the 15th lecture within this, its poverty and inequality work, but with a special focus on gender. We have been discouraged by our country's lack of progress in realizing Madiba's dream of a non-sexist South Africa. We have been horrified by the deepening, deepening cultures of misogyny, and we have become convinced that the continuing struggle against patriarchy was fundamental to everything we are doing. I think you will agree with me that developments in South Africa in the last 12 months have confirmed the soundness of that analysis. The two very recent headline cases of men being heavily sentenced for crimes against women remain sadly the exception rather than the rule. 
reported case after reported case of abuse have filled our media space in 2017. And many harrowing narratives have emerged of women who have carried the experience of abuse without report. None more compelling in my view than just the just published and brilliant memoir of Sison Gemsiman, Always Another Country. In this book, memory and imagination come together to convey with such power, grace, and resilience the story of how society can normalize the abuse of girls and women. We need to keep reminding ourselves of the millions of stories in our country which are not being heard, and how, as Sesonke poignantly captures, horror that lasts a lifetime for many women can arise out of the intimacies of trust and respect suddenly violated. In this context, this is the context which informed our invitation to Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed. She has a long and proud record of leadership in her home country, Nigeria, in the United States, and on global platforms. She speaks with authority on issues of gender in their multiple intersectionality. She's an international expert on development and played a significant role in the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals. She's a professor at the University of Columbia, one of the Nelson Mandela's Foundation's partner institutions. I could go on, but it is hardly necessary to read the CV of the UN's Deputy Secretary General. <laughs> Let me just also say that I have discovered that she is a warm human being with a sense of humor I think Madiba would have appreciated. She, she never met him, but she has engaged deeply with his life and work. I'm looking forward to Ms. Mohammed's contribution today and welcome her warmly to the esteemed Nelson Mandela annual lecture platform. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in offering her. file is orange. <laughs> I don't think I've been this orange for a very long time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dear Chairperson of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Professor Ndebele, our Chief Executive, Mr. Hatang, Honorable Trustees, Excellencies, Friends, Family, new family that I met today, Tokyo and, and uh, friends. I so am deeply grateful to the Nelson Mandela Foundation's Board of Trustees for this tremendous honor. Thank you. As Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations and a former minister in my country, Nigeria, I've been fortunate enough to experience many remarkable moments in my life, but few have been more humbling than standing before you today. The speakers who have come before me, left and right, have all walked a path of courage, of compassion, of conviction, and they are truly a hard act to follow. I'm particularly honored to be here this year as we approach the centenary commemoration of Madiba birth in 2018. My feelings about Nelson Mandela, Madiba, are deep, and I know that they are shared across this country, this continent, and the world. 27 years ago, Madiba was freed after 27 years of unjust imprisonment. At 71, he finally walked his long road to freedom. And we all stand today on his shoulders with a shared sense of respect, admiration, and pride for the feat that he accomplished. As a young girl growing up in Nigeria, I was proud of our country's contributions to the liberation struggle in South Africa. For the first time, paying taxes had a profound meaning for many of us. History has since moved on. But we should never forget this solidarity, to reach across borders, to transcend differences, protect our core values, and combat all that threatens our humanity. Today, 
our world needs this more than it has ever done. The fabric of our society is fast losing its vibrancy and its strength. Multilateralism, peace, development, and human rights are all threatened by a leadership vacuum across the globe. Yet we see sparks of hope in our continent, where the African spirit of solidarity is expressed even in the most challenging of times. For example, in Uganda today, with its myriad of challenges, still manages to host hundreds and thousands of South Sudanese refugees, giving them hope and a chance to survive and thrive. As a young girl, my earliest memory of the liberation struggle was when I was 11 years old, and I asked my father if we could visit South Africa. And he sighed and said no, that this is impossible for a family like ours of mixed heritage. Why not, I wanted to know. And he tried to explain the unexplainable, uh, that as it was constituted, a black father, white mother, we'd be breaking the law. In apartheid South Africa, we would be segregated, mother, father, child by race. The horrifying reality saddened me that human beings could do such a thing to one another. Later in life, like millions of other people, I instinctively understood that this racist system was a truly frightening abomination, a violation of all that makes us human and a threat to the fabric of our society. Yet, the unbending courage and conviction of Nelson Mandela, his leadership, and his comrades kept the world full of hope. President Mandela once observed that the depth of oppression in South Africa at that time created the height of character demonstrated by leaders of the African National Congress. I believe solidarity and the deep sense of one's right to justice kept the flame alight. And that in itself is a warning that we should not take for granted. In the course of history, among great leaders, Mandela has towered, but he was the first to say he was not a perfect human being. In fact, yesterday, I had the privilege of being given a tour of the office and the archives of the Nelson Mandela Foundation and read his own handwriting, how Madiba reflected on this when writing a book on his years as president. He noted that he was concerned that he not be regarded as a saint, for only God is perfect. He would have preferred to live as a man to remind us that the possibility of such humanity exists in each of us, that then to be turned into a myth. Mandela confessed some qualities that could be considered flaws today, but he manifested them as virtues. For example, we learned he was stubborn, but his stubbornness was attached to a profound sense of fairness. Nelson Mandela was relentlessly stubborn when it counted in fighting for justice and equality. These are core values that I believe are reflected in the issue that I am pleased to have been asked to speak about today, centering gender, and reducing inequality through inclusion and sustainability. This struck me as an ideal subject for a lecture in the name of Nelson Mandela, as it provides an opportunity for me to address what remains perhaps the most pervasive inequality globally, in every country and in every society, that of gender inequality. And to reflect on it at an opportune moment, as we launch today the 16 days of activism and mark the International Day of the Elimination of Violence Against Women. But also as we witness a now a global movement building momentum to say no more will this violence against half our population, our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, be invisible or worse still, treated with indifference. And on that note, I would humbly ask that we stand for those that have lost their, lost their lives of gender-based violence and even more so for those that have survived. Thank you. Nelson Mandela's profound legacy contains the inspiration that I believe we need to address the core of my lecture, putting people at the center to reduce inequality through inclusion and sustainability. 
contemplating the driving force behind his spirit, its depth, its compassion, and the source of energy. I would have to sum it up by simply saying, it is the courage of one's convictions. His courage, even in the darkest moments, though maybe he may not have had any more to give. His moral courage was defined in his DNA. He would never compromise his convictions, even at the cost of his freedom. He stared life-threatening danger in the face and refused to be cowed. He lived through his family's suffering, for his long walk to freedom was also that of his nearest and his dearest. When he declared that he was prepared to die for an ideal of democratic and free society, this was not an academic promise, even if it started as an ideal. He made his declaration in an entirely undemocratic racist society before a judge who was weighing whether to impose the death penalty. The judge stopped short of capital punishment, but his sentence to imprisonment on Robin Island put Mandela at grave risk and tantamount to being the living dead. Today, I had the immense honor of seeing Robin Island for the second time, and I would like to thank Tokyo, Yoanda, Peter, for granting me that personal tour. It was an emotionally laden visit. As I walked across the landscape, I thought about his arrival along with his fellow political prisoners. The prison warders, at that time, we understood, spoke to them like animals, urging them to move faster. But Mandela led his fellow politi political prisoners to slow their pace. The state could rob Mandela of his freedom, but never of his dignity. As Madiba himself often said, the struggle succeeded thanks to the bravery and sacrifice of thousands of nameless individuals who stood up to the violent, racist ideology of apartheid and gave their lives to the cause. We must honor this legacy by realizing their vision of true equality. We should reflect today if we have stayed faithful to the sacrifices that have been made. The Constitution of South Africa, as we often have heard and said, is a shining example of turning the most brutal lessons of a bloody history into the most humane protections of a rights-based ideal. But we must still ask, how does it serve today in our collective responsibility to operationalize it. In so many ways, South Africa has been a leader internationally. The United Nations is proud to have benefited from the wise counsel and active contributions of a number of sons and daughters of this great nation. This includes my colleague, the outstanding head of UN Women, Pumzili Mlambu Nguka, who I'm proud to call a sister, a friend, and a mentor. I know that she's saddened not to be here with us today. However, today marks the International Day of Elimination Against Viol Violence Against Women, and her leadership is raising awareness on this global pandemic that is needed everywhere. She follows in the footsteps of other South Africans, including Navi Pillay, our former High Commissioner for Human Rights. And there are many others that are so, so such a long list, I would never do justice to all of them, but Sh Charlotte Maxikik, Lillian Ngoi, Albertina Sisulu, Gertrude Chopi, Emma Machini, Winnie Mandela, Sophie de Bruin, Helen Sussman, Mampele Ramapele, who is right in front here with us. They are the product of an incredible women's movement in this country. In the mid-1950s, some 20,000 women of this country marched to protest, to protest the past laws. Their slogan was powerful, you strike a woman, you strike a rock. Many have cited this moment as a turning point in the struggle against apartheid. From that moment in the 1950s, through the struggle, the negotiations for a democratic country, and the Constitutional Assembly that provided this country with one of the most progressive constitutions globally, South African women have been leaders for change. They are proof of one simple fact. Given the opportunity to participate fully, we have in half our population the capacity, the resources, and the potential to address the most pressing challenges that we currently face. What is needed is to break down institutional and attitudinal barriers and invest in the full contribution 
of women and girls to their societies and their countries. Gender equality was central to Madiba's vision of equality and central to the struggle for freedom. This was the result of women's tireless mobilization. But it was also a reflection of leadership that understood that equality cannot be selectively applied. Leadership who held a vision of a society where there was no discrimination on the basis of race, class, gender, or any other category. Nelson Mandela taught that freedom is indivisible, noting that the chains on any one of my people were the chains on all of them. The chains on all of my people were the chains on me. Speaking before the first parliament in 1994, he declared that freedom cannot be achieved unless the women have been emancipated from all forms of oppression. He practiced what he preached, but we still should reflect, are we practicing what we preach? A number of women here today were present in 1992 at an historic ANC conference in Durban, where Mandela stood up, stood up to men who opposed his firm pledge of 30% quota for women MPs. It is this kind of leadership that we need globally at the moment to achieve transformative and sustainable change within a very short time. This is important, as when it comes to gender equality, we are often told that change takes time perhaps even generational change. This country is evidence that wholesale change is possible. During the democratic transition, women's representation in parliament increased tenfold from 2.7% to 27%. African women went in a few short years from the indignity of being a minor from the cradle to the grave to holding some of the most powerful positions politically and economically. Yet sadly, the long walk to freedom for women and adolescent girls globally remains unfinished. The continuous battle of overcoming structural barriers as well as cultural and social challenges must be fought with a new narrative that addresses the current context and constituency of young people that have long been left behind. Around the world, women still hold less than one third of senior management positions in the private sector. Fewer than one quarter of all parliamentarians are women. Violence against women in homes and war zones remains a global pandemic. Up to one in three women has experienced violence in her lifetime. There are nearly 50 countries that do not even have laws against domestic violence. In 37 countries, marriage excuses rape. This country knows these statistics all too well. Reading the front page of a Johannesburg daily newspaper yesterday, I saw similar facts. One in four women are the victim of violent abuse. An estimated 100 rapes occur per day, and half of children are abused before they turn 18. Marginalized and younger women are particularly at risk and often suffer greater consequences. Young women who experience intimate partner violence are 50% more likely to have acquired HIV than women who have not experienced violence. And while we have seen positive progress to address violence against women in some countries, in others we have in fact witnessed a pushback on women's rights and the dismantling of legal protections of violence, weakening our struggling democracies. On the economic front, if we look at the labor force, we find women doing some of the most important work in society for the least compensation, unpaid domestic work, which often involves taking care of loved ones, falls on three times more women than it does men. In formal workplace, women's equal contribution is not valued equally. And women earn, on average, 70 cents to every dollar that is earned by a man. This ratio is far greater amongst our marginalized groups. A report that was issued recently by the World Economic Forum last month noted that it would take 217 years to equalize the pay and employment opportunities of men and women. Perhaps most disturbing is that this number has increased from the 170 years researchers calculated a year ago. So which direction are we going in? meaning that we are in fact seeing the gender equality gap increasing rather than decreasing. 
reproductive health services and reproductive rights have been hard won in many places, but now they face new threats. This despite the fact that we know that access to family planning measures are some of the most impactful tools we have to address poverty amongst women. These stark statistics and facts are only one side of the picture, however. The empowerment of women is more than a social imperative or a matter of justice. It is essential to achieving sustainable development, protecting our environment, and securing peace. According to the World Bank, girls who finish school earn nearly 70% more than girls who have to drop out. And that boosts GDP annual growth rates by 1.5%. So if we're not thinking about the rights, think about the economies. When women are kept out of the labor force, everyone pays the price. Put another way, we know that women's equal participation in the labor force would unlock over $12 trillion in global growth. And that money could be used to further access education, health, and services for all, not just women, for all. We have evidence that one of the greatest predictors of stability and resilience to conflict is levels of gender equality in a society, and that women's meaningful participation in peace processes increases the sustainability of peace by 30% over the long term. Our focus on prevention in the United Nations today really underscores the importance of dialogue, of mediation, and we are really, truly honored to have um, Mama Grassa as one of the Secretary General's mediators um, for, in the panel that we have. There could not be a more important moment to realize the importance of gender equality to the challenges we face. Our current global context context includes sustained and horrifying levels of violence across a number of new and protracted conflicts, taking development gains backwards and leading to the highest levels of individuals uprooted from their homes at any time since the end of World War II. One of the greatest threats to global security is violent extremism. I've seen its effects in my own country and around the world, and I've met with the survivors. Extremists of all types seek to curtail women's rights, the rights to education, to health, to political life, freedom of association and movement, and freedom to make choices. Violent extremists are using gender norms to radicalize and recruit, redefining roles and the identity of men and women. It is for this reason that gender equality is an anathema, a big part of the solution to ending violent extremism. Coming from Northeast Nigeria, I know that terrorists are not born. They are shaped from an environment that excludes young people, that decimates religious teaching and cultural beliefs, converting communities into an ideology of subjugation. Two weeks ago, I had the wonderful opportunity, an extraordinary set of meetings in my office. As the Deputy Secretary General, it's common for me to speak to high-level officials, but that day, I met with teenagers. The first, I had a dialogue with a young girl named Eklas Baju. She's a Yazidi woman who was captured and held by Daesh, suffering horrific atrocities. I was deeply moved by her plight, but what struck me even more than her incredible story of endurance and survival was her powerful voice for justice. This young girl had been through worse crimes than most of us could ever imagine. And yet, she was outspoken, strong and an unstoppable advocate for the cause of peace and an end to violence against women and girls the world over. As we walked out of my office, there were two other young women ready for my next appointment. One of them was Hawa Mohammed, victimized by Boko Haram, a lone face out of the thousands of girls like the Chibok girls who have suffered as a result of the terrorism in my own country, Nigeria. The young woman from Nigeria and this young woman from Iraq instantly embraced each other. Although they spoke different languages, they easily communicated messages to each other. They said, don't give up hope. Let us win over the terrorists. Let us reach across the divisions. Let us build a better world. <clears throat> 
I left that day knowing that there is nothing more important than giving girls like this a platform to reach the world for those who have been left behind without an authentic voice. Sadly, the context we face in our world today poses new threats that go beyond terrorism. We also face the major threat to security and development that is posed by climate change, exacerbating poverty and vulnerability of the poorest in our societies. No one can deny that climate change is real. It's man-made and has had a role in pushing up global temperatures. And I often say, if we look back the decades to which man has been at the center of causing the climate change we see today, if women had been involved in those decisions, we probably wouldn't have had the same kind of climate change. <laughs> but having said that, if we are responsible for climate change, then absolutely we are also have, having the collective responsibility to find the solutions and to put an end to what we see every day across the globe, where the signs are with us everywhere. I believe the drought in Cape Town is one of those that many may deny, but there are clear reflections of climate change. We know that women, especially in poor countries, are more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. In fact, climate change has exacerbated those that have tried to escape. Once they escape from the terrorism in northeast Nigeria, I can tell you they just go straight back into the desert because there is no green Lake Chad anymore. A Lake Chad that in my childhood, we would ride on a hovercraft thinking we were going to the UK. Today, it is less than 10% of what it was then. So climate change is real. In 1991, Bangladesh cyclone five times as many women as men died. In the Indian Ocean tsunami, women accounted for more than two thirds of all deaths. In recent months, the Caribbean witnessed hurricanes that wiped out the GDP of a country overnight. These storms will become more intense and more frequent in the coming months and years. These crises are, as a result of climate change can be turned into opportunities to build back better for all addressing the investment gap for women that reduces the potential and value of a country by over 50%. Socially, environmentally, and politically, women have proven that when you invest in them, you get results for all. The question is how to build on these gains and achieve true gender equality. The answer is investment in women's empowerment in all its ramifications, along with a cultural shift in mindsets so that women's equality is a given in all societies and not a luxury. Dear friends, today I've skirted over the surface of the huge challenges that we face today. And I believe from Cape Town and its drought to the lost opportunity of South Sudan and its hard-won independence, to the Sahel and its battle with terrorism, human slavery and drug trafficking, to Myanmar and the ethnic cleansing we are witnessing, to femicide in Latin America, opioid wars in the middle of the United States to migration and the refugee crisis in Europe, our global village is truly in a really big mess. But I believe that all is not lost. In 2015, the world came together and the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda was born. It was a four-year journey that was the most inclusive process ever held by the United Nations for Development. And we owe a great debt of gratitude to a wonderful lady, Mama Grassa Michelle, who served as one of the eminent Sustainable Development Goal advocates and a member of the high-level panel on the post-2015 agenda. The 2030 Agenda constitutes a universal plan for action for ending poverty and ensuring a life of dignity for all. It has been called a Declaration of Interdependence, composed of 17 goals and 169 targets. And often people ask me which one of those goals is your favorite, and they all want me to say goal five, gender. But what I will say to you is that each and every one of them, like my kids, is very special. But together, they're amazing. <laughs> they envisage transforming the way governments interact with people, businesses, communities, and all of us with our environment. They also have the unprecedented ambition to free humankind from the tyranny of want. 
The goals have already achieved a seismic shift in our approach to development. It is no longer just about social development. It is about the whole of our development, our economies, our environment, that we should grow, that we are able to pay and not beg for money for the services that are due to our people in health, in education, in access to water and sanitation and a safe environment in which to thrive. The framework builds on the many successes since the 1995 Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing, where about two-thirds of countries in developing regions have gender parity in primary education. Fewer women are, die, are not dying so much in childbirth, and more girls survive past childhood. We could literally fill the entire hall with documents proving that well-educated women who have equality and political participation and the jobs market raise income for everyone and improve living standards for generations to come. So we know what to do, and we even know how to do it. And we know that women and girls are now at the heart of the Sustainable Development Goals. These goals can change history by ensuring women's rights and leadership around the world. In the UN, I'm very proud that our Secretary General Antonio Guterres speaks out at every opportunity against misogynist mindsets. He's working for gender equality within the UN and around the world. His new strategy on gender parity provides a roadmap to reach gender parity within the UN. And we're working to strengthen our own financing, capacity and expertise on gender equality so that we can better support countries to achieve their own goals. So we are trying to walk the talk. Left and right of Antonio Guterres are two women, one from Latin America and one from Africa. So as the <laughs> I think the Pope says, blessed is he amongst women. Well, absolutely. <laughs> But we will only realize the potentials of the Sustainable Development Goals, as ambitious as they are, if we take seriously the values of inclusion and leaving no one behind, literally leaving no one behind. The sustainable change that we need to see will only be possible if we're including young people, girls and boys. I've spoken at length about women and equality because it is true that women continue to be less equal than men globally. But gender is not equal to women. Gender inequality, norms, and stereotypes affect men, women, girls, and boys. The same educated girls were the same girls that were kidnapped by the uneducated Boko Haram terrorists. So when young boys are taught that it is not manly to cry, they learn to suppress their emotions. When young men are taught that violence is masculine and accepted, we create the next generation of those who seek solutions at the barrel of a gun. When societies dictate the role of men as breadwinners or aloof and distant fathers, we disempower families and create public policies that don't match the realities of our households, our communities, and our societies. In the past week, before giving this lecture, I've invited those on social media to send me their thoughts. And I have to tell you, I was crossing my fingers. <laughs> I don't know we'll come across in, in uh, social media these days. Old people like us don't know what we're going to get. I will tell you a story that I was reading. Someone had said that my president had, um, had told untruths. And so I quickly tweeted, my president doesn't lie. And I didn't live for the next week because <laughs> it was, you know, is your president God? <laughs> But, you know, it is really important because young people today, that's the way they communicate. And we really want to feel the pulse of what they feel about the issues that we think are central to the solutions that we should have. Just put a tweet out. And I want to thank all of those who participated. Many of the comments were insightful and spoke of concrete actions and need to ensure financial inclusion, address violence, and increase protections and services. But what also struck me were the great number of men who spoke of the need for gender inequality not to dispossess or disempower men. While the dismantling of privilege is never easy, this country has perhaps shown us that it can only be done sustainably when all see the benefits for themselves and feel a greater part of the solution. <laughs> gender inequality affects every one of us and addressing, addressing it is equally our shared responsibility. That change will need to happen with our youth. 
Over the past two days, we've heard the voices of our young girls here in Cape Town. What they have spoken about is the need for girls to have space to convene, to support each other, to be listened to, to be part of the solution, to be part of the solutions that will be, we hope, um, transgenerational. We are witnessing, as we speak, an unprecedented moment, a global momentum that may have begun in perhaps an unlikely place, but which is carrying reverberations in many corners of the world. The hashtag MeToo movement is opening new conversations, in some cases, frightening, establishing new shared understandings, understandings of unacceptable behavior, and shedding new light on the perverse, pervasive nature of gender inequality, as did the He for She campaign. It is an opportunity to shift the tide and one that we should collectively seize for positive change. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, Madiba had a very long walk to freedom. Most of us could not even fathom this journey. At the end, he said, he discovered that the secret after, many, after climbing a great hill, only one finds that there are many more hills to climb. Leadership at all levels is the key. Madiba showed tremendous integrity in stepping off the platform when the applause was loudest. Unfortunately, he hasn't infected many with that virus as he left. <laughs> Grasa, we should have bottled it when we had the chance. <laughs> we should be inspired by his necessarily long walk and make it a fast run to gender equality. We need to galvanize the international community, which includes all of us in this room, to invest in women and girls and to give them space so that they can contribute to progress. And no small amount of space is small or too small. It, it, it can enlarge itself around the globe. It is one hashtag that can just infect the whole world and that's what we need, movements around the world. I am perhaps the first person to deliver this lecture who never met Nelson Mandela. In a sense, I represent generations of people to come who will take inspiration from his life without ever having had the privilege of a personal encounter. However, I, be I believe I learned a little of who he was through a great woman of Mozambique and South Africa. His wife, his better half, his best friend, Grasa Michelle. She embodies the same vast commitment and courage as her late husband, the same inspiring passion to raising a new generation of girls, and the same immense spirit of humanity, and a rare woman of substance who just tells it like it is. Thank you, Grasa. And I think it's important that we actually talk about our women and our girls. We don't talk about them enough. In Africa, parts of my country, it's a shame to talk about yourself or to talk about others. You leave others to do it. So we need to hear louder voices about the wonderful things that our girls and our women do in this continent and carry it into the global village. Because success builds on success. No one wants to be part of failure. Everyone wants to be part of success. And we need to sell the story of successful women in Africa. I met three young girls just outside in the hotel and they were telling me about what they were doing here in Cape Town, earning money and giving 50% of their proceeds to the orphanages here. And they were just doing this by caps and, and embroidering caps and trying to find an opportunity to make a contribution to society. Three young girls who've not yet finished school. This is a story to carry around the world. This is something that we should spread because it inspires, it also builds their confidence and hope that things can change and they don't always have to be as they are. Collectively, we see the hills before us and we are challenged to climb them. For climb, we must, there is no other option. And I feel, if we feel defeated, we can return to Madiba's indomitable bravery and humanism. He possessed a character that none of us could emulate. But we can all be inspired to try. Just as the world came together to support the end of subjugation on the basis of race in this great country, we need today to birth a new movement, 
and calls for true equality everywhere. We as leaders need to be collectively responsible. We need to stand up take that decision for our current failings, but also for the actions that we must take to end conflict, injustice, inequality, corruption, and ensure true inclusive democracy, peace, and prosperity for all our people. I'd like to leave you all with a call to action, to invest in the missing 50% of our human asset base, the potential of our women and unleash their power for good to make good on the new era of the Sustainable Development Goals, starting with Goal 5 as your docking station for the other 16 goals that will create a world of true gender equality. My promise to you as a woman of color, a Muslim, a proud mother of six, and a grandmother of one, in a position of privileged responsibility serving alongside Antonio Guterres is to strive to leave the UN fit for purpose of healing our world and ensuring we keep hope alive for those who deserve a life of respect and dignity. <laughs> Finally, thank you. Finally, in Madiba's words yet again, he says, it always seems impossible until it's... Thank you very much for your patience and attention. Ms. Mohammed, if you had any questions at all about whether what you said has hit the right note with the women of South Africa at the very least, I hope that your questions are answered. Thank you very much. Thank you for reminding us of the strong foundation and legacies of women that have come before us that it is our duty to build on. In you, in you, Mama Michelle, Ms. Patricia Denil, we see the possibilities of what we can be. And I'm looking across, <laughs> and I'm looking across at the right side of the room, my right, your left, 
and there is dozens of young women who have been sitting and who have been listening. And you have not only shown them, but you have shown all of us of what is, it, what is possible when we answer the call to purpose and when we put people first. Thank you very much. One of the important things that she raised was that it is International Day of, on the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Girls, and it coincides with our local campaign of 16 Days of Activism Against Women and Child Abuse. And you may be wondering why there is so much orange in the room. <laughs> it is not a mistake, it is not coincidental, but in fact, it's part of the orange campaign that UN Women is running together with local sponsors, EDCON, I believe, also being one of those partners in that campaign. And on the 25th of every month, they're making a call to all of us to join them in wearing the color orange as a way of signifying and standing with the UNITE campaign against gender-based violence. And today, being the 25th, it is fitting that from 7 p.m. tonight, if you take a look at Table Mountain, it will be colored in orange as part of the campaign. So now that we have all been conscientized, on the 25th of every month here on, we will remember that perhaps we need to get a little bit more orange in our wardrobes. That's where I will wrap it up for this afternoon. Allow me to call back upstage the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Mr. Salah Hadan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kathy. I don't know what to say to thank you. <laughs> Mayor Amina Mohammed, I have never seen people break into song and the speaker cry immediately <laughs> until today. So you're singing, and the three standing ovations, at least, that I counted, I, because I tried to sit the first time and then I had to stand up, and then I <laughs> sat down again because you kept on urging us to sit down, uh, is the longest standing ovation that I've witnessed in the Nelson Mandela election. Re go leboga go mena gane re itse gore mafoko a gago a tla dula le rona mo dipelong kana go tsotlhe that translation will come later <laughs> yours was truly an ins inspiring lecture which touched on many issues that the NMF has been grappling with over the years despite me traveling fairly often to Robben Island it is always an important experience for me to note how history can bind us, but in reckoning with it, we can be liberated. We can unbind ourselves. With gender inequality, we can be clear that the depths of uh, pervasive patriarchy in our society can never be underestimated. I agree with you that uh, with selective application, we will never find a solution, and I'm encouraged by many in my institution who are able to call out our blind spots, including my own. It is galling to note that my daughter would never end the same as my son's, but that it would take 217 years to find equality. What you told us today is that we're planting seeds of inequality into the future. Your speech outlined how this remains a global struggle. Whilst we may be blinded by our national struggles, we must display a global solidarity exemplified by the young Iraqi and Nigerian women that you told us about. I must say that it was a story that broke my heart but also lifted my spirit. We often ask ourselves, what should the objective of the Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture be? How do we look back at this event in a year or two and judge whether the lecture has been a success. 
Can we justify the costs, both financial and in terms of human capacity after the event? I don't know if I should ask these questions after what you delivered. The annual lecture is more than a platform for a speaker that we admire, one that I personally admire in you, and instead is a unique platform to drive debate on critical social issues. Let me remind you that two years ago, we hosted Thomas Piketty, who told us that inequality is the worst thing that can happen in terms of what would happen uh, 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 regarding conflict in, in, in the world. Out of his message, we launched with many partners the Mandela Initiative. Last year, we hosted Bill Gates. And again, Tate Bill Gates reminded us that we need to be taking the cause of young people forward. That it's uh, things like uh, stunted growth as a result of food insecurity is a serious problem. And we then launched again this year, focus for Mandela Day was on food security. With your lecture, we will then bind gender inequality into the Mandela Initiative. And in February next year, the intersectionality between inequality, poverty, and gender will then be woven in with your speech at the core. Over the last few years, we have focused primarily on the causes and ramifications of inequality. Yet as we engage with this and the complicated history that has given rise to, the, to this way of life, we must also look toward the future. The future that we want to build requires a reimagination of societal centers and margins. More specifically, it requires a centering of the most vulnerable. To quote Madiba when he said, as we dream of and work for the, generation, the regeneration of our continent, we remain conscious that the African Renaissance can only succeed as part of the development of the new and equitable world order in which all the formerly colonized and marginalized take their rightful place, makers of history rather than possessions of the others. Close quote. In South Africa, we encounter daily an ongoing cruelty in our system. It is an unimaginable and pervasive cruelty. The story of the young Michael Gomape, who died in a pet toilet, whilst his brave family, with the help of organizations such as Section 27, fight for the restoration of his dignity even in death. That should move us all. Mayor Amina Mohammed, you noted that Nelson Mandela couldn't be robbed of his dignity. Let us not rob our people of their dignity on a daily basis. We have heard the accounts of what transpired through the public testimonies during the commission of inquiry into the life as it demanded tragedy. The stories are some of the most brutal and harrowing accounts that rightly deserve to be compared to the realities under apartheid. Accountability must be demanded. We can no longer accept that the most vulnerable, <laughs> we can no longer accept that the most vulnerable in our society are left to their own devices on the peripheries.